Gates of Hell by Pamela Green and Effort House Senior. Fade in. Exterior, European home, office, night, late 1920s. In the dim office of an upper-class home sits a man, 70s, at a desk, in a robe, writing. Atop the desk is a cigar in an ashtray, a glowing lamp, and a name plaque reading Sigmund Freud. He pauses to puff on a cigar. As he proceeds to write, a male voice speaks in English. Let us return once more to the question of religious doctrines. We can repeat that all of them are illusions and unsusceptible of proof. Siggy gazing out a window. He again writes, the voice speaks. We shall tell ourselves that it would be very nice if there were a God who created the world and was a benevolent providence, and if there was a moral Lord in the universe and an afterlife. But it is a very striking fact that all this is exactly as we are bound to wish it to be. Interior, late 1800s, European home, office, day. In casual attire, Sigmund stands observing books on a shelf. He has a seat, begins writing. The man's voice again speaks. The greater the number of men to whom the treasures of knowledge become accessible, the more widespread is the falling away from religious belief. Exterior, courtyard, park bench, day. Sigmund now sits on a park bench in fine 1920s attire, holding his cigar and writing. The voice proceeds. It is a fantasy structure from which a man must be set free if he is to grow from maturity. Dissolved to, Sigmund, lying on a towel at a beach, writing. The voice proceeds. In the long run, nothing can withstand reason and experience, and the contradiction which religion offers to both is all too palpable. Exterior, lake, beach, day, summer, 1935. Charles, tall, lanky, late 30s, in cowboy attire, stands trick roping near the lake as his daughter, Ethel, 12, dark hair, and son, 10, in western attire, a plot nearby. As the cowboy continues on with his craft, a crowd forms and joins in on the applause. Soon, Charles takes a bow. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now, my daughter will accompany me. Charles swings the rope, lassoing his daughter. More applause. Charles and his daughter smile, taking a bow. Thanks. Next, my son will join in. He spins the lasso as his two kids jump in and out of the rope. The fans throw money into the rope. The trio bows. Thank you, folks, very much. Moments later, Charles and his kids, still in cowboy attire, walk along near the lake as Charles sings a yodeling cowboy song. Exterior, city sidewalk. Charles, with cowboy hat and lasso, exits a trolley with his kids. They all begin to walk down the city sidewalk. Interior, exterior, Charles's house. Charles and kids reach a white frame home with an upstairs balcony. He opens the door, revealing an upstairs stairwell. Interior, Charles's house, living room. Atop the stairs, Charles opens yet another door. They enter a room set in humble early 1900s decor. Interior, Charles's house, kitchen. Charles finds his wife, Mabel, long black hair, 5'2", mid-30s, pregnant at the stove. He approaches Mabel. Hello, shorty. Mabel turns towards Charles. He bends down, kisses her forehead. So how did it go, Romy? Great. We drew a few crowds and made some money. Thank the Lord. Glad to hear. With our growing family, everything helps. Mabel turns back to the stove, adds potatoes to a pot. Charles empties his pockets of the money, piling it on the table. Mabel glances at the stash. Charles approaches Mabel, giving her a gentle hug. And to think, this one makes half a dozen. Interior, Everett's house, living room, day, the next year. A fan blows as Ethel, now 13, and her sister, Martha, blonde, age three, sit with their brother, Everett, blonde, age one, on the floor, waving paper fans and sipping iced tea. Their aunt, Eldora, dark hair, late forties, sits on a couch nearby, fanning herself and sipping tea. She peers down at Everett as Ethel gives him tea. You're a cutie, aren't you? Everett smiles up at his aunt, face flushed. As Ethel fans him, the aunt opens her purse, pulls out a small bag. Girls? Care for some lemon drops? Wide-eyed, the sisters quickly look up at their aunt. Yes, please. Aunt Eldora holds out a bag of candy. The girls, in turn, help themselves to a few pieces. Thank you. You're welcome. She returns the bag to her purse, staring wide-eyed. Dissolved to, Eldora, now 17, purchasing iced tea at the 1904 World's Fair, and then taking a drink. Back to the present. Aunt Eldora appears startled as Mabel sits on the couch. I'm back. It's so nice of you to come for a visit, Aunt Eldora. Can you believe this heat wave? Hardly. It's been
been an absolutely sweltering summer. Ethel shares her drink with her little brother. You've got you a fine bunch of kids, Maple. Why, thank you. If only your mother could have lived to see them. It was such a tragedy, her dying so young, and you being just a child. And then us losing your sister and her baby in that dreadful tri-state tornado. You just never know when it will be a loved one's time to go. Eldora again stares wide-eyed. Flashback to spring 1925. As Eldora narrates, a younger Eldora, 30s, races into a house as a massive tornado strikes the town. It felt like the end of the world that day. Seemingly out of nowhere, those dark, boiling clouds were upon us. Monstrous it all was, and so deafening. Back to the present. And to think that it claimed the lives of so many. If only we were warned. Flashback to Funeral Parlor, March 1925. Mabel, aged 23, weeps beside her sisters and baby's shared coffin. Back to the present. It was a dreadful one indeed. Ethel and Martha sit, gazing wide-eyed up at their aunt. Sometimes things happen in this life that are just plain hard to understand. Yes, but it's in those times of crisis that we must hold all the tighter to the good Lord's hand and not let go. So true. So true. The girls play peekaboo with Everett with their fans. Speaking of tragedies, those tremors and dropping spells that Charles has had for years now are growing worse by the day. Such a pity. He's still so young. <clears throat> yes. It's quite unfortunate. Whatever do you think caused them? Flashback. As the conversation trails on, Charles, in cowboy attire, rides on a feisty horse. Suddenly the horse rears his head back towards Charles, giving him a powerful blow to the head. Blood spews from Charles's nose as he loses consciousness, falling to the ground. Quickly, some cowboys come running to his aid. I'd say it was from his terrible horse accident. Poor Charles. Back to the present. Even still, he was a good competitor, but finally gave it up. I don't remember Dad ever losing rodeo. And he broke wild horses, too. Outlaw horses, they were called. Such a determined man. Yes, it was. It must run in the family. His grandpa even drove his horses to death on the Oregon Trail. Ethel gives Everett another sip of tea. Poor things. Speaking of ancestors, some of ours came over from Switzerland. You don't say. At the request of William Penn for religious freedom. I heard their father was even imprisoned in a castle for his beliefs. Oh my. Well, I'm so grateful that we have religious freedom here in America. So am I, dear. So am I. <clears throat> Interior, Everett's house, kitchen, day, spring, 1939. Everett, nearly four, and Martha, age six, wash jars and tubs of water that sit propped up on chairs as boxes of jars await nearby. Meanwhile, Mabel chops up numerous tomatoes, onions, and peppers. Suddenly, Charles enters the room. When the task has once begun, never leave it till it's done. Be thy labor great or small, do it well or not at all. Dissolve to the children finishing up the last of the jars. Mom, we're done. Mabel turns towards the children and the drying jars. Thank you both. Great job. Mabel turns back to the stove. The children approach her. Is it ready yet? No, Everett. It takes a long time for chili sauce to cook. May we go play now? Yes, you may. Thanks, Thanks Mom. Mom. Everett quickly exits the back door as Martha follows. Exterior, Everett's house, back porch, day. Everett, age four, tinkers with a pair of pliers as Martha, age six, and their brother Sam, age eight, play nearby. Thunder rolls. Look, the storm's coming. As they play, the sky darkens. Lightning flashes. It's getting closer. Rain begins to pour. Boom, thunder. They stump. They jump, startled. Let's go inside. Everett continues to grip on the pliers. Crash, more thunder. Lightning strikes Everett, haloing about his head. The other children shriek. Everett swings open the back door and then rushes through the house, screaming. At last, he finds his mom, running safely into her arms. What's the matter? What's the matter? Everett's siblings quickly chase after him. Everett got struck, struck by lightning. lightning! Mabel stoops down, peers worriedly into Everett's eyes. Poor child! Are you okay? Yes. I'm okay. Interior, Everett's house, bedroom, night. Everett lies awake in bed as his mom dozes soundly beside him. Rain and flashes of lightning are displayed through the window. Everett pulls the covers up tightly towards his eyes, then peers wide-eyed at the window. More lightning. 
Boom, boom. More loud thunder. I'm a scared. I'm a scared. Everett covers his head as his mom stirs from her sleep. What? The lightning. It's going to get me. It can't in here. Now go to sleep. Everett slowly peeks out from the covers. Good night. Interior, Everett's house, kitchen, dusk. Charles shakily sits with a cup of coffee as Mabel places food into a lunch bin. Everett holds up a paper plane. See? Dad, airplane. Everett flies the plane across the room. Mm-hmm. That's a good one. Mabel sets the lunch bin down on the table by her husband. Here, Rami. This will tide you over. Thanks, Mabel. You know, every time I think about this night watchman job, I can't help but say a prayer of thanks. My boss could have easily hired someone more able-bodied, and I appreciate the older kids working now, too. Yes. I am grateful for their help, but it's sad that it must be at the expense of their education. I do hope that at least one of them will be able to finish high school. That would be nice. Charles takes another sip of coffee. Well, time to go. Charles struggles up from the seat. He kisses his wife. I love you, Mabel. I love you too, Romy. <clears throat> Living room. Charles crosses the room towards the door as Everett follows. He then opens the door. As he turns back towards Everett, he playfully rumples his son's blonde hair. It's the end of the line, Everett. See you later. Exterior, Everett's house, balcony. A country gospel song trails from Victrola down below as Everett peers over the railing with his plane. He spots his dad, then watches him slowly, feebly, makes his way along the sidewalk. Suddenly, Everett flies the plane over the balcony. Exterior, Everett's house, yard, the following day. Everett retrieves his plane from the yard. As he walks along, he discovers a cocoon hanging from a nearby tree with a caterpillar struggling to break free. Dissolve to Martha finding Everett by the caterpillar in an empty cocoon. Um, I'm telling Mom. Everett looks up, wide-eyed, as his sister hurries off. Mom! Dissolve to Mabel approaching the tree. What have you got there, Everett? It's a caterpillar, Mom. It was trying to get us, so I helped it. Now it can never be a butterfly. Oh, no. That's okay. But remember, they're supposed to struggle their way out. That's what develops their wings. Yes, ma'am. Interior, Everett's house, living room day. Everett watches as his dad, crippled over, removes a steel guitar from off the wall. Then, with difficulty, in the key of A, Charles picks out a gospel tune. Dissolve to Charles hanging the guitar back up on the wall. Interior, Everett's house, Charles's room. Charles lies down in his bed, then shuts his eyes. Interior, Everett's house, living room. Everett climbs up onto a chair, carefully removes the guitar, and then has a seat. He attempts to play a song. Interior, Everett's house, Charles's room. As guitar sounds trail in, Charles quickly opens his eyes. Interior, Everett's house, living room. Charles enters the living room in a fluster. Everett, you stop that. You know you're not allowed to touch my guitar. Everett looks up from the guitar, wide-eyed. Dissolve to Everett on the couch, wiping his tears as his dad approaches. Okay. Since you really want to play, I'll give you a lesson. Charles retrieves the guitar. He lays it on Everett's lap. You can start by playing on just one string. Everett attempts to play a gospel tune on one string. Once you learn on the one, you can play on two then three, then four. Everett now tries playing on two strings. You're catching on. It'll get easier if you don't give up. Interior, Everett's house, basement, day. Everett, his family, and others stand singing Jesus Paid It All as Charles shakily sits singing nearby. Dissolve to Sam, hand raised, being prayed for by Sister Pearl, 20-ish. Lord, bless this boy today. As Sam falls back, speaking loudly in a strange language. Thank you, Jesus! Exterior, Everett's house, street, slash basement, later on. Two policemen exit a patrol car. Now, what's this all about again? Noisemakers. Oh, yeah, I hear them. They approach the basement and knock. Pearl answers. Yes, they help you. Who's making all that racket? Quickly, he barges in and yanks the boy up by the arm. Be quiet, be quiet, stop that! Sam quiets down, looks around, then has a seat. What's wrong with him? He got the Holy Ghost, sir. We're having church and I'm the preacher. The angry officer rolls his eyes. Oh, I see. Holy rollers. Well, 
I'll have to write to your ticket, ma'am. Do try and keep your church in order. Dissolve to, the officer handing the preacher lady the ticket. Have a nice day, officers. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Likewise. Interior courtroom day. Sister Pearl sits in a witness stand as a judge sits at his podium, glancing through some papers. Let's see. It says here that a boy at your church was disturbing the peace. Care to explain? Your Honor, we were just having a good old-fashioned prayer meeting. Sometimes we can't help but be loud when the Lord shows up. See, Your Honor, this boy received his prayer language the other day. A gift from God that the Bible calls tongues. Dissolve to Aunt Josie, late thirties, sitting in a witness stand. Your Honor, we're God's people, and we need prayer during these war years. This country was founded on prayer. I'm from Poland, Your Honor, but I came here for religious freedom, and prayer is what holds this country together. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the court, this lady and their people have done nothing wrong. The judge becomes teary-eyed. And I wish to God that our country had more of them. Case dismissed. The judge pounds his gavel. The courtroom cheers. Exterior, Everett's house, sidewalk, basement today. Long lines of people trail down the sidewalk on both sides of the house as faint sounds of singing and shouting are heard. A woman approaches two men in line. What's going on in there? Ma'am, they're having a revival. My mom came here the other day and got the Holy Ghost. Yes, sirree. She came a hooping and a hollering, just like they're doing in there now. Dissolve to Everett peeking out from the basement door as sounds of shouting, praying, laughing, and singing are heard. Interior, exterior, department store, day, Christmas Eve, 1940. Everett, age 5, Martha, age 7, and Mabel, age 39, all in coats, approach a shop window garnished in Christmas decorations. They stare at the display, then enter the store. Soon, Everett spots a monkey on a string toy. Look! Mommy, may I have it, please? Mabel glances at the toy's tag. No, Everett. It costs too much. Everett looks down sadly, hands one atop of the other. Interior, Everett's house, living room, that night. Mabel stands holding a few tiny presents. She walks to a corner of the room and then deposits the gifts atop a red cloth spread out on the floor and then stares. Furrow brow. Interior, Everett's house, living room, Christmas morning. Everett approaches the red cloth, now laden with more gifts. He kneels, scavenges through the gifts, and then opens a tiny present. Finding a top, he smiles. He opens another small gift. Again, he smiles. He opens a larger one. He looks troubled, and then opens one last gift. As Everett stares at it blankly, his mom enters the room. Morning, Everett. Merry Christmas. But, Mom, I already got some of these presents last year. That's right. You did. And you had stopped playing with them, so I wrapped them back up for you. Interior, Everett's house, living room, night, spring, 1941. Mabel, age 40, enters the living room, finding Ethel, now 16, sitting in a rocker, reading. Looks up at her mom as she grabs a sweater, hat, and umbrella off the rack. Please keep an eye on the kids for me till I get back. Okay, Mom. Take care. Thanks, dear. Mabel exits. Thunder rolls. Everett peeks into the room. Where's Mom? Oh, she had to go somewhere. She'll be back shortly. Everett heads over to a window. Soon he spots his mom walking along in the rain. Thunder rolls as she disappears into a dark alley. Everett walks past the rocker, then exits the room. Boom! Thunder crashes. Lightning flashes beneath Ethel's rocker. She looks up, wide-eyed. Exterior, interior, small church, sanctuary. Lively music is heard as Mabel nears a church. She enters the building, finding a crowded, mainly African-American congregation. As the musicians continue to play, people everywhere are dancing, shouting, singing, or praying. Two ladies, both African-American, dance around with their eyes closed. Without even opening their eyes, they head towards Mabel and lay hands on her shoulders. Lord God, touch this woman. Be healed now, sister, in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Amen. With their hands raised and eyes closed, Mabel shouts, Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The two women resume dancing as Mabel moves her shoulder. Interior, Everett's house, kitchen. Day, summer 1941. Mabel, age 40, scans her sparsely clad pantry as Everett, age 6, approaches. Hi, Mom. What are you making? Oh, Everett. Why don't you boys go get the wagon and head over to the train tracks? I believe they're unloading the cherries today. Oh, boy. Sure. Exterior, city sidewalk. Sam, age 10, pulls Everett along the sidewalk in a wagon. Exterior, train tracks. 
The boys reach the tracks near a building marked Cold Storage Building. As they hide beneath the train car, workers roll five-gallon cherry cans down a ramp from the train car to where they're emptied into a large container. The boys grab some of the discarded, mostly empty cherry cans and then begin combining their contents. Soon, a man spots them. He whispers to a fellow worker. The men begin to leave more cherries in the cans. Everett sneaks another. Looky, here's a bunch in here. Sam grabs another can. Great, here's some more. Dissolve to the boys loading the filled cherry cans onto the wagon. Okay, let's go. Interior, Everett's house, kitchen. The boys lug the cans in. They set them down on the table. Here, Mom. Mabel approaches the filled cans. She gasps. More than I thought. Thank God. Exterior, Everett Street, day, winter, 1941. Everett, age six, adds a few sticks to his small wagon load of wood, then travels on with it. Soon he spots another small wagon up ahead, piled high with coal. Dissolve to Everett approaching the wagon. He finds his cousin, Buster, age seven, slowly pulling the wagon while eating a raw onion. Hey, Buster. That sure is a lot of coal. Oh, hi, cousin. Yep, it sure is. Buster eyes Everett's nearly empty wagon. Hey, Everett, I can drop this here load off and help you get more firewood. Okay, thanks. The boys busily tear off pieces of old, dilapidated fence and then load them onto the wagon. Interior, Everett's house, living room, evening. Everett and Buster sit by the wood stove, each eating a piece of cherry pie. Interior, Everett's brick house, living room, day. Mabel stands at the front door with Everett, age six, and Martha, age eight. Okay, remember, by the time I get back, I expect this whole house to be clean. Yes, yes ma'am. Ma Everett and Martha frantically wash dishes, straighten things up, dust sweep, then mop the floor. <coughs> Dissolve to Everett peeking out a front window as his mom walks down the sidewalk towards the house with a full bag in each arm. She's back! She's back! Kitchen. Martha puts up the last glass before her mom enters the room. Mabel sets down the groceries. She looks around. Thank you both. Great job. Interior, Everett's brick house, bedroom, evening, months later. Mabel enters the bedroom as Charles rests in bed. I took off from work early today to see about getting us a little help with food. Oh, how'd it go? They turned us down. It was very disappointing. I'm sorry to hear that, Mabel. I wonder why. Well? Flashback. Mabel sits at a table in an office with a mail worker in a business suit and another mail worker nearby. Ma'am, your income qualifies, but since you're buying your home instead of renting, there's just no way we can help you. But sir, I've scraped and saved every penny and dime I could for years to get that house. This woman can't eat the bricks, sir. Back to the present. Good for him. So glad someone spoke up for you. Yes. It made me feel a little better to know that some people out there still have heart. Exterior, Everett's Brick House, Backyard, Day, Spring, 1945. Mabel stands by Everett, now age nine, holding a duck. See, Everett? A baby duckling. Mabel hands the baby duck to Everett. Well, hello, little fellow. It's for you. Oh, wow. Mom, thanks. Dissolve to Everett with his collie dog, Teddy, holding the duckling. Teddy, say hi to Biddy. As Everett holds the duckling out, the dog sniffs Biddy, then smiles. Everett sets the duck down. It hops about chirping as Everett observes the grassless yard. Gotta do something about this yard. Exterior, Everett's brick house. Backyard day. Everett busily hoes the backyard. Suddenly he stops to wipe sweat from his brow. Dissolve to Everett scattering seed over the dark, freshly turned dirt. Interior, Everett's brick house. Kitchen day. Everett watches from a window as rain drenches the ground. Exterior, Everett's brick house. Backyard day. Weeks later. Everett, Biddy, and Teddy lie sleeping in the lush green grass with Biddy, now bigger, nestled between the dog's paws. Exterior, Everett's Brick House, Basement Day. Mabel stirs a barrel of sauerkraut as Everett, age 10, eyes a bike. Where'd you get the bike, Mom? Somebody gave it to us. You can have it. it just needs some fixing up. Exterior, Everett's Brick House, Yard Street Day. Everett paints his bike a bright red and adds a shiny chrome fender to it. Dissolve to Everett taking his bike out onto the street. As Everett rides the bike, along comes Buster, age 11, on a brand new red one. Buster spots the refurbished bike. Quickly, he parks his own, leaning it against the side of the house. Then he hurries across the street to Everett. Hey, Everett, I like your bike. That sure is nice. Can I ride it? Okay. 
Buster rides the bike back and forth on the street. I like this one even better than mine. I want to ride it some more. Okay. Buster smiles, continues to ride the bike. Exterior, grocery store, street, day. Everett parks his bike outside his store, enters the store, exits with two bags full of groceries, then rides the bike home freehand while clutching the bags. Interior, Everett's brick house, kitchen, day, that often, 1945. Mabel peers into the newly bare pantry. She then stares out a window at the falling leaves. Later that week, Everett enters the kitchen as his mom braids dough. Oh, Everett, just to let you know, we'll be having the duck for Thanksgiving. Everett gasps, staring wide-eyed at his mom. Biddy? But mom, you can't! I'm sorry, Everett, we must. Besides, people eat ducks all the time. Well, I'm not having any. And Biddy isn't just a duck, he's my pet. Everett stares a little longer, becoming teary-eyed, and then dashes off. Interior, Everett's brick house, hallway, day. Everett stands, furrow-browed, arms crossed, outside from the dining room as the sounds of clanging utensils trail from inside. This roast duck turned out nicely. Mm -hmm. But poor Everett. Exterior, Everett's brick house, backyard. Everett sits teary-eyed, his arm around his collie dog. Interior, Everett's brick house, kitchen, day, spring, 1946. Everett approaches his mom with a black eye. Mabel gasps. Oh my, what happened? I got in a fight after school. Whatever for? The kid kept calling me mousy and pushing me. The bully. Interior, Everett's brick house, kitchen, day, months later. Everett does a series of push-ups using two chairs. Interior, Everett's brick house, bathroom, morning. More buff, Everett flexes a muscle in the mirror. Interior, school, hallway, day. As Everett stands at his locker, a male student spots him. Hey, yeah, you must be walking out. Yeah, a brother of mine in the military taught me some exercises. Good for you. Now maybe they won't be calling you mousy here anymore. Exterior, vacant lot, day. Everett takes punches in the abdomen by a group of boys without cowering. Interior, Everett's brick house, living room, evening. Everett, now 13, plays the steel guitar, holding the slant straight across over the strings. Sam, now 17, approaches. Everett, want to see what I learned the other day in class? Sure. Everett hands Sam the guitar. Sam sits down with it. Okay. If you want to sound more like the Grand Ole Opry, then hold the slant diagonally over the strings, instead of straight across, like this. The guitar across his lap, Sam plays some chords while holding the slant diagonally over the strings. He then passes it to Everett, who begins to play the chords too. Also, you can add a C7 chord. Thanks, Sam. Exterior, City Street, Day, Winter, 1948. Everett trudges along in two feet of snow, lugging his guitar and amplifier, block after city block. Exterior, church. Shivering, Everett climbs the stairs of a church with his amp and guitar. Interior, church, platform. Everett plays his guitar while singing up front in church. Interior, Everett's bedroom, evening. Everett prays on his knees beside his bed, then gets up from the floor. He sits down on the bed, and then closes his eyes and raises his hands. Suddenly, he stares toward his hands. Lord. I feel heat radiating from my hands. Son, that's my healing bow. Everett stares wide-eyed. Exterior, sidewalk day. Everett takes a stroll with his mom, age 47, down a sidewalk. I'm so glad that you got the baptism the other night at church, Everett. Me too. Everett spots a man walking with his arm in a sling. Hey, Mom, that man over there's got a hurt arm. I want to pray for him. No, Everett, you'll make a scene. Exterior, city sidewalk day. Everett walks down the sidewalk. He looks around and spots a man with a limp. Would you like prayer for healing? A prayer? Shook it for my ankle. Everett lays his hand on the man's ankle and prays. Be healed, ankle. In Jesus' name! The man wiggles his foot and takes a series of steps. No more pain! I'm healed! Praise the Lord. The man walks off just fine. Soon a woman approaches. Ma'am, need any prayer for healing? Why, yes. I've got cancer. Everett lays his hand on the lady's head. Lord, I rebuke cancer from this woman's body. In Jesus' name. The lady fidgets by her neck. She appears surprised. Gone! Thank you, Jesus! Interior church sanctuary day. Everett, now 15, sits among the congregation with his mom and sister, Martha, 17, as the preacher stands at the podium. Jesus doesn't play games with sin, folks. No, sir. You're either hot or you're cold. If you're lukewarm, he'll spew you right out. He'll send you straight to hell. He will. 
People are so full of evil. Just look around, always wanting something other than God to satisfy. Well, that's adult tree, folks. You don't need no wife or husband or anything else. All you need is Jesus. Interior, Everett's brick house, bedroom, night. Everett lies in bed, eyes open. Lord, I followed you to the nth degree of my life, but I'd still like to get married someday. Dissolved to, Everett lying in bed, eyes closed. God doesn't accept you anymore. He's turned his back on you. Everett opens his eyes abruptly. Yeah! God, help me! Interior, Everett's brick house, bedroom, night, months later. A much thinner, 98-pound Everett kneels in the dark beside his bed. Lightning flashes and thunder crashes. Lord, I feel such a heavy burden to pray. I don't quite understand, except it feels like I'm in some sort of terrible spiritual battle against the very forces of darkness. It feels like evil is coming against me, and even your whole church. Lord, I've been fasting and praying, and I believe you will deliver me from these forces. Everett stands up, shaking his fist towards the ceiling. I command these strongholds to come down in Jesus' name. More lightning flashes and thunder crashes. Interior, Everett's brick house, kitchen, morning. Everett enters the room, finding his mom ladling oatmeal. Hi, Mom. Wouldn't you like some breakfast first? Oh, no thanks. See you later. Interior, high school cafeteria, day. During lunch, Everett sits again with no food. Interior, high school, principal's office. Everett finds his principal, Mr. Sim, at his desk. Uh, Mr. Sim? May I please speak to the students over the PA system before they're dismissed for vacation? I'd like to tell them that Jesus cares about them. What? No, young man, you may not. Everett turns and leaves, hanging his head down as the principal scowls after him, shaking his head. Interior, Everett's brick house, living room. Mabel enters her front door as the phone rings. Quickly, she sets her purse down and then hurries through the room. Kitchen. Slightly out of breath, Mabel answers the phone. Hello? Good afternoon, Mrs. House. This is Mr. Sim, Everett's principal. Oh yes, is everything all right? Intercut, Mr. Sim sits in his chair on the phone. Well, not exactly. We think your son may need a psychiatrist. A what? A psychiatrist. See, earlier, ma'am, Everett entered my office requesting to speak to students over the PA system about Jesus. Back to Mabel's kitchen. Mabel covers her mouth. Imagine that. I've also noticed that he's gotten to be very thin. Yes. He has appeared stressed lately and hasn't wanted to eat much. So you think a psychiatrist could help? Perhaps. I just spoke with someone who suggested removing him from school and having him committed. Committed? That's quite a step. I'll have to think this all through and then I'll let you know. Thanks for calling. You're welcome, Mrs. Haas. I'm very sorry. Interior, Everett's Brick House, living room day. Everett enters the living room, finding his mom sewing. Mom, since I won't be going to school anymore, I'd like to get a job. Okay, that'll be fine. Interior, shoe store, day. Everett enters a shoe store. Dissolved to, Everett fitting customers for shoes. Interior, church sanctuary, platform, day, a year later. Everett sits up front playing a gospel song on a laptop steel guitar. Dissolved to, a traveling preacher approaching the podium as Everett steps down. I'm an ex-professional piano player, folks. This young man plays so good and never misses a beat. After church, a man and his wife approach Everett and his mom in church. Ma'am, your boy's got talent. Why, thank you. As a matter of fact, my wife and I have talked it over, and we'd love for him to travel with us in our ministry. Everett's face lights up. That's very kind of you both to offer, but I think we'll pass. But mom? Um, I said no, Everett. Oh, well... We sure wish he could, but we understand. It's a big step. Thank you anyway, sir. You're welcome, young man. Maybe sometime down the road. Interior, Everett's brick house, living room, night. Everett kneels beside the couch, Bible open and praying. Lord, I really wish that I could travel with that couple, playing music for you. I think that would be great. But anyway, I still feel like you're not even listening. Dissolve to. Everett becoming drowsy reading the Bible, still on his knees. Interior, Everett's brick house, living room, the next morning. Mabel enters the room, finding Everett on his knees, slumped over the couch, asleep. Bible still open. Land sakes, you must have fallen asleep reading the Bible. Everett begins to awaken. Hmm? 
Oh, hi, Mom. I, I guess I did. Not very comfortable, I'd say. It's not too bad. I'm trying to read the whole Bible. Well, that'll take some time. Just be sure you're getting enough sleep, too. Interior, doctor's office, day, months <laughs> later. Mabel signs in and then it's a seat beside Everett. Soon, a female nurse enters the room. She checks the list. Everett House? Everett gets up, follows the nurse through a doorway. Resolved to, Mabel still seating, now twiddling her thumbs. Soon, Everett and the doctor enter the room. Mabel stands. Everett has a seat as the doctor speaks with his mom. Mrs. House, I don't recommend hospitalizing Everett. You don't? No, ma'am. I don't believe he needs it. He's just a young boy going through some stress right now. Well, why don't you just keep him home? Well, I'd still like to have him evaluated at the hospital, to, to be sure. But thanks for your advice. Interior, Everett's brick house, Charles's bedroom, evening. Mabel sits beside Charles, now age 55, as he lies in bed. We went ahead and signed the papers today. I wasn't sure what to do, but the doctors at the hospital sounded so promising. They seemed to agree that committing him would be the best thing. But that other doctor sure didn't think so. He practically begged me to keep Everett home. Uh, I really don't think it's a good idea to put Everett in that place. Mabel, the majority isn't always right, you know. Well, I still think it's our best option. God be with him, that's all I could say. I'm sure he will be. I'm sure he will. Exterior, hospital, stairs, day, summer, 1952. As the narrator speaks, Everett, age 17, still very thin and carrying a guitar. Mabel, age 51, and Sam, age 21, climb the stairs up to an old institution. And so it goes. Everett is led up the stairs of an institution, not knowing what is behind its foreboding doors, and with no guarantee that he will ever even be allowed to leave the place. Interior hospital, solarium, dead. An attendant escorts the trio into an upstairs solarium crammed full with multiple beds and all male patients. Here you are. Everett looks around at some guys staring and point at him. Thank you. As the attendant leaves the room, Mabel becomes teary-eyed and gives Everett a hug. I love you. We'll be praying. Thanks, Mom. I love you, too. Sam gives Everett a hug, also. Bye, Everett. I'll see you later. Goodbye. Mabel and Sam leave. Soon, a male patient approaches Everett. Why? You're all mixed up. I am? Yes. Your nose runs and your feet smell. Everett smiles as the man walks off snickering. Another male patient, 30-ish, approaches Everett, right hand outstretched. Hi, I'm Jacques. And uh, who are you? Everett shakes the man's hand. I'm Everett. Nice to meet you, Everett. You too. You must be French. Oui, monsieur. So, Jacques, how'd you end up here? Well, back when I had a job, I'd pick up my check each payday, cash it, and then head downtown to give money away to the poor, homeless people. So a relative thought I must be crazy and had me committed. It was your money. How awful. I agree. A pretty nurse enters the ward. Jacques smooths down his hair. Excusez-moi, my friend. The Frenchman approaches the nurse and then bows. Bonjour, mademoiselle. Your eyes are exquisite. He takes her by the hand, kissing it. The nurse giggles. Merci. Interior hospital, dining room, evening. Everett sits eating at a table with other male patients. So, where are the forks? They don't allow them. Only spoons. Oh. Everett picks up his spoon as he begins to eat his salad. He glances towards a man sitting nearby with big rolled up papers beside him. What are those? These, my boy, are charts of numbers, special dates, and such. Why, there's even one of the stars. Oh. Did you know that the date in which a person is born or dies or other personal information such as a phone number, address, or license plate number often contains hidden meaning and history repeats itself? Interior hospital solarium, night, days later. As other patients sleep, Everett kneels beside his bed. I want to believe you're still with me, Jesus. It feels like I'm being beat over the head by the devil and that you're no longer listening. Everett climbs into bed and then closes his eyes. Dissolve to dream. Everett sees a huge Jesus in full color from ground to sky with his arms outstretched upon the horizon. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Quickly, Everett wakens and then kneels beside his bed. 
Thank you, Lord, for speaking to me and letting me know you're still with me. Interior Hospital Solarium Day, the following day. Everett sits conversing with his mom. Everett, the doctors want to give you shock therapy. They think that this will really help you. Everett looks puzzled. Shock therapy? Mom, I don't need any shock therapy. Jesus appeared to me last night in a dream, in full color, and I'm fine now. Well, I still want you to have the therapy. I already signed for it. Mom! Enough, Everett. I love you. Mabel gives Everett a hug. I love you too. Interior, hospital, cloakroom window, morning. Cloakman stands behind a counter off of a hallway as rolls of clothing lie stacked in tall piles behind him. Okay, come get your clothes. Those receiving therapy, no clothes, and no breakfast either. In pajamas, Everett and other male patients form a line. Dissolve to, Everett approaching the cloak window. Name? Everett House. The man skims the list. Nope, no clothes for you. Interior, hospital, vacant room. <clears throat> a male attendant escorts Everett in pajamas into a room. Wait right here. The attendant leaves the room. Everett kneels down. I don't understand. You helped me, Jesus, and now I'm better. But they still want to give me these strange treatments. Have your way, Lord, but please get me out of this somehow. EST, Solarium. Everett is led behind a petition where he finds Dr. Adam in his 50s, a female nurse, and seven male attendants. He also finds a bright light, a bed, and a small machine at the head of the bed with two paddles. Everett looks uneasy. Suddenly, the doctor's hand slips, touching one of the paddles with his finger. Don't! <laughs> that hurt. <laughs> Everett drops to his knees beside the bed in prayer. Lord, have mercy for what they are about to do to me, a young 17-year-old boy. Everett gets up, then lies down on his back atop the bed. Quickly, a stiff cushion is placed behind his back, and he's gagged with a metal tongue wrapped in a cloth. The machine's contact points are briefly placed to his temples as seven burly men hold him down, three on each side and one at his feet. His body jumps violently. Convulsing, he is wheeled across the room where other patients lie, still gagged on stretchers. Some are awake, while others groan unconscious with their heads moving. Interior, hospital, corridor, day. Everett and other shocked patients wander the halls. Interior, hospital, dining room, day. Everett and some of the other guys sit quietly eating lunch. Interior, hospital, solarium, night. Numerous patients lie in their beds, most with their eyes closed. Everett lies staring towards a window. Lightning flashes, thunder crashes. Everett flinches. Interior, hospital, cloakroom window, morning. Shock day, days later. The cloakman again calls to the pajama-clad patients. Okay, guys, come get your clothes. As they line up, some patients fuss. Not again. You can't do this. Yeah. Calm down. You can't get your clothes back if you don't cooperate. Big attendants step forward. The group quiets down. Interior, hospital, corridor, morning. Everett and numerous others are wheeled through the corridors and tunnels of the hospital on stretchers. Interior, hospital, large room. Everett and the other patients are lined up, row after row, on stretchers and given mass shock treatment. As the narrator speaks, Everett, still gagged, awakens to find patients in their usual post-shock state. Again and again, Everett is brought before this strange machine, and for the next six months is sent farther and farther into a realm of darkness, despair, loneliness, and fear with each treatment. Interior, hospital corridor, day. Everett wanders down a hallway with some fellow patients. Flashback. As the narrator continues on, scenes from Everett's growing up years, being struck by lightning, his dad being angry over the guitar, being given the same Christmas presents, losing his pet duck to Thanksgiving dinner, getting a black eye, and the devil claiming that God had forsaken him. Good memories of his life begin to fade. Bad memories intensify. Back to the present, the narrator continues as Everett proceeds down the hall. His very soul feels open and vulnerable to all sorts of evil, and many of his thoughts become incoherent. Bit by bit, the beastly machine eats away at his memory. Interior, hospital, dining room, evening. Everett stares at his food. He then turns to a patient nearby. No oh, good. Fried chicken. Ain't neither. It's fish. Everett picks up his spoon and begins to eat. Interior, hospital, corridor, evening. Everett wanders down another hall as the narrator speaks. Nevertheless, every now and then, a Bible verse will come to Everett's memory. He quotes each one perfectly. Suddenly, Everett stops. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Interior Hospital, Office Day. Mabel meets with the doctor in an office. Ma'am, we have evaluated your son, 
and will be transferring him to another facility. You'll be given more shock therapy there to make further progress. All right. Thank you, Doctor. Interior Hospital, Solarium. <coughs> Day. Mabel stands near Everett in a solarium. Everett, the doctors say they're moving you to another hospital. Mom, all I need is to get out of here and go home. Well, Everett, I think they should know what's best for you. But, Mom! I've got to go. I love you. I love you, too! Mabel gives Everett a hug. Exterior, en route to the new hospital. Day. Everett, Jacques, and others are shuttled into the new hospital in a 1950s vehicle. Interior, hospital corridor. Everett walks down a hallway. Suddenly, a piano is heard playing faintly. He pauses, looking around, wide-eyed. Interior, hospital, piano room. Everett finds a man playing piano. As he stands listening, another man approaches. Ain't that nice. They let him and another guy take turns playing all the time. It seems to go on non-stop. Interior, hospital, corridor, morning. Everett and the others sit outside the electroshock therapy room in pajamas. Attendants exit the electroshock therapy room. One attendant calls out. Everett House? Everett slowly gets up from his chair, looking down at the floor. Not again. Interior hospital, EST room, morning. Everett's POV. As Everett protests, the men drag him, beat him, and then throw him up onto the bed. Everett looks around defiantly at the attendants as they gag him and then brace him for the treatment. Muffled protests are heard. The doctor administers the therapy. Darkness. Interior hospital, solarium, day. Everett stands solemnly in the solarium. Suddenly, Jesus appears to him, to his left. Everett trembles, wide-eyed. Behold, I am with you, and will be with you through this all. I have you here for a special reason. Jesus vanishes. Everett looks about, wide-eyed. He then approaches a window, finding a tiny sparrow chirping wildly on the ledge. Poor thing. How'd you end up all the way up here? This bird knows your suffering, and I know your suffering. Interior Hospital, Solarium Day. Sam stands by Everett, holding a letter. I wrote a ministry about you. They wrote me back and sent a prayer cloth with it. Here. Sam has Everett the letter and the prayer cloth. Bam! The power of God hits Everett. He strides about, carefree. It feels like I'm walking on air. Everett opens the letter and reads aloud. Dear Sam, I have prayed for Brother Everett and will remain in agreement with you for his deliverance until... He is out of the mental institution. Teary-eyed, Everett looks towards his brother. Thanks, Sam. You're welcome, Everett. Interior hospital, bathroom, day. Everett stands at a sink in a bathroom with the door propped open. Holding up a bar of soap, he smiles. Dissolved to, Everett carving into the soap with his fingernails. Later on, Everett holds up a miniature bust of a little girl, curls and all. Suddenly, a male doctor stops by. Did you make that? Yes, sir. May I have it? Sure. Everett hands the bust to the doctor. The man studies it. Now, isn't that beautiful? Thank you. No, thank you. Smiling, the doctor walks off, admiring his find. Interior hospital solarium, night, weeks later. Everett lies in bed, wide-eyed. But as the shock treatments wear on, Everett becomes even more discouraged. In the desolate hours of the night, most times not even knowing what day it is, he lies awake dreading the moment when he will once again be informed of his fate. He feels as if his head may burst open at any moment from the very centre. Interior Hospital, Corridor. As Everett and the other patients sit along the wall in the hallway, a new nurse, a young woman, comes running up from the electroshock therapy room, sobbing and throwing up. quickly being ushered into the EST room. Interior, hospital, dining room, evening. At dinner with the other guys, Everett bows his head briefly in prayer, then sits. Interior, hospital, solarium, day. Mabel spots Everett sitting down. Slowly, she approaches. Hello, Everett. How are you? Mabel's eyes are met with a troubled look. Mom? Yes, it's me. I missed you. Your dad and Ethel say hello. Ethel? Who's Ethel? Mabel gasps. She looks worriedly into her son's face. Why, Everett? Don't you remember? No. She's your sister, of course. Do you know what day this is? No. It's Saturday, Everett. Saturday! 
Mabel goes and sits on a step of the entryway, sobbing. They told me they could help you. What have I done? What have I done? Interior hospital, Solari, in the night. Everett lies in bed, hands behind his head, staring upward. Mental vampires. Interior hospital, office day. A female worker at a desk holds out some paper to Everett. We need to fill this out so we can evaluate your progress. Everett accepts it, has a seat, then looks it over. One question reads, do you believe in God? He marks, yes. Interior, hospital, corridor, day. Everett picks up a small stack of papers from atop a trash can and begins to read. Shock therapy. Everett skims the papers. Soon he gasps, wide-eyed, and then quickly returns them to the waste can. Interior, hospital, piano room, evening. Everett stands in a doorway as the pianist plays. Interior Hospital Solarium Day. Sam, again holding an envelope, visits with Everett. Everett, here's a letter from another preacher. Everett accepts the letter, opens it. A preacher man speaks. Dear Brother Everett, I was put into a mental institution for one year after the devil plagued my mind with demons appearing to me, but God gave me victory over the devil. I know what you're going through, and I've learned that the devil is a liar. My only advice to you is to not even believe your own mind. Instead, believe the word of God. God has let me know that Jesus suffered more spiritually than physically, and the horrors of hell and mental torment were poured out on him. Everett looks up from the letter at his brother. Thanks, Sam. You're welcome, Everett. Interior Hospital Solarium, night. Everett kneels by his bed and prays and then gets into bed. Interior Hospital Corridor, morning. Everett, Jacques, and a long line of other patients, all in pajamas, sit again along the wall. Soon, two attendants exit the EST room. One attendant calls out. Jacques Bouchard? EST room. Inside the shock room, attendants beat Jacques to the floor and then throw him up onto the bed. No! Please! No! He is gagged and held down. The doctor administers the current. Blood spews from Jacques' mouth. The female nurse gasps, wide-eyed. He's hemorrhaging! She grabs towels and then attempts to clean up the blood. Back to the corridor, as Jacques is quickly wheeled past the long line of patients, Everett spots his friend, hemorrhaging. He gasps. Oh no. God, help him! Interior hospital office day. A female worker again holds out some paper to Everett. Dissolved to, Everett again marking yes on his paper after the question, do you believe in God? Interior hospital corridor morning. A male doctor stands with nurse Cooper, a female nurse. Be sure and keep all religious material away from the patients. Yes, doctor. Interior, hospital, dining room, evening. At dinner, Everett picks up his food with a spoon. He turns to a fellow male patient eating nearby. I really wish I had a Bible. Mm -hmm. Dale, an elderly man, stares in Everett's direction. Interior, hospital, solarium, day. Everett approaches Nurse Cooper in the ward. Ma'am, can you give me a Bible? A Bible? No, we don't allow them. Well, they should. As the nurse walks off, Everett bows his head in prayer. Lord, I'd love to have a Bible. Interior hospital corridor day. Dale slowly shuffles down a hall. Soon he finds a worker sweeping up a pile of trash. As he glances at the debris, he spots a portion of book that appears to have belonged in a Bible. He smiles and then slowly retrieves his find. I want this. Okay. Thanks. Solarium. Dale slowly approaches Everett, clutching the worn book. Everett, here's something I'm sure God wants you to have, and you've been looking for, wanting to have. The old man slowly holds out the worn pages to Everett. It's part of a Bible. Where from? I just got this, sir, from the trash where someone was sweeping up the floor. They, they would have thrown it away, but I picked it up. Thanks, Dale. Thanks a lot. You're welcome, Everett. Dale shuffles away as Everett reads from Isaiah 43.2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Interior Hospital Corridor Day. As Everett walks along, he notices a hedge of protection around him uh, that moves along with him. It is square-shaped, two feet thick, and reaching his shoulders. Interior, hospital corridor, morning. Everett and others sit waiting as patients are brought protesting into the EST room, one by one. 
an attendant calls for Tim, a young, strong, handsome fellow. Tim Harlan? The patient turns to those seated nearby. This is my first time. Tim enters the room. Soon, muffled protests are heard. Dissolved to, attendants dragging Everett into the EST room. A series of shots of Everett lying down, convulsing. Interior, hospital, EST room, recovery side. Everett, still gagged, awakens in a cot, surrounded by other patients on cots, also in their post-shock state. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. Interior hospital, dining room, evening, later that day. At dinner, as the man's voice narrates, Everett observes the new patient sitting, hanging his head in a stupor. Everett notices that many of the patients receiving the therapy no longer behave as they once did, such as the newcomer. For seeming somewhat normal when first brought in, they soon evolve into brainwashed subhuman creatures, though some more quickly than others. Lord, could it be possible that this hell that man has made is worse than the hell that you made? Interior Hospital Solarium, morning. Everett awakens as the sun shines in through the windows. Interior Hospital cloakroom window, morning, shock day. As a man frowns, walking off empty-handed, Everett slowly approaches the cloak counter. Yep, yeah, you do get your clothes. Everett looks wide-eyed as the older fellow retrieves his clothes. He bows his head. Soon, the worker returns. Here you are. The man hands Everett a roll of clothes. Interior Hospital dining room, morning. At breakfast, Everett sits by Mr. James, an older patient. It's nice to get a break, huh? Yes, it is. Maybe you're all done with him. I hope so. Interior Hospital Solarium Day, weeks later. As Everett and other male patients sit around, Sid speaks. Have you used her to the cold room? Some of the guys shake their heads no. Bruce replies. What's that? It's where they keep the patients wrapped up naked, frozen sheets and strapped to the beds. Everett and the other patients gasp, wide-eyed. Sounds like torture. Yeah, it's pretty sad. Some of them are left in there for days at a time, some even for weeks. Interior hospital cold room day, days later. Everett is led to the cold room by attendants. As he looks around, he finds patients just as he was told. A female nurse determinedly beats apart some frozen sheets. Dissolved to, Everett, wrapped in stiff, ice-covered sheets as he is strapped securely to a bed by the nurse and attendants. No, please. It's so cold. Later on, still wrapped and strapped, Everett and other patients waited out, shivering and teeth chattering, while one of the other patients, also wrapped and strapped, received a shock treatment nearby. Interior, hospital, dining room, evening. Everett, Jacques, and other men sit eating dinner. Everett is grateful to finally be rid of the shock therapy but it's sad to find that his friend Jacques doesn't fare as well. Interior hospital, cloakroom window, morning, shock day. At the cloak counter, Everett is handed his clothes and then walks off. Then, as the narrator speaks, Everett turns back, watching as Jacques approaches the counter. Jacques turns around and then, looking down empty-handed, slowly walks away. It seems to be, just as it had been with Everett, that a key part of Jacques' mind remains shielded against the devastating effects of the shock therapy unlike many of the other patients. But before it is over, Jacques is forced to undergo numerous more of these treatments, and often accompanied with hemorrhaging. Even so, Jacques continues to be one of the kindest, most devoutly religious persons that Everett is ever given the privilege to encounter. Interior hospital corridor day. Male doctor approaches female nurse in a hallway, handing her a paper. I want you to start these patients on insulin shock therapy. Interior hospital room day. Everett lies in bed, sweating while tossing and turning, and then convulses. Interior, hospital, corridor, day, autumn, 1955. As Everett sits in a hallway with other male patients, he spots a man, late 20s, staring at him among a group of doctors. Soon, the man and doctors all begin to walk towards Everett. As they approach, the stranger extends his right hand. Hello, I am Dr. Levitsky, and who might you be? Everett reciprocates the handshake. Everett House. This is the man who will get you out of here. He will deliver you from them. Well, it's nice to meet you, Everett. See you later. Okay. Bye. Everett continues to sit and watch as the doctors walk off. Interior, hospital, corridor, day. Everett walks by Ned, a young man standing at attention. Hi. Ned draws back a fist. Everett sways and then walks on. 
Interior of hospital office. Male doctors assemble around a conference table as another man, Dr. Wilson, stands at the head of the table. Any further questions? Dr. Levitsky raises his hand. Yes, uh, Dr. Levitsky. I want to take charge of the Everett House's case. You do? Yes. Yeah, all right then. Thank you, sir. Interior hospital office. Seated at a desk, Dr. Levitsky flips through a file. Interior church sanctuary night, weeks later. Mabel, Ethel, and others sit listening to a male preacher. Are there any more prayer requests? Mabel raises a hand. Yes, Sister House. I'd like prayer for my son Everett. He's having brain surgery. Okay. Anyone else? Small group shakes their heads no. Then let's join hands in prayer. Dissolve to the small group assembled in a circle, holding hands. Lord, we ask that you be with Everett during surgery. Guide the doctors and keep our dear brother safe in Jesus' name. Yes, Jesus! Thank you, Lord! Amen. Interior Hospital Solarium Night. As the other male patients sleep, Everett lies on his back in bed, hands behind his head, staring at the ceiling. I will lift up mine eyes to the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Interior Hospital Solarium Morning. A female nurse approaches Everett as he awakens. You have to go up to the medical school over the sixth floor. They're giving you a lobotomy. Everett stares solemnly at the nurse for a moment. Oh. Moments later, Dr. Levitsky approaches Everett as he sits on the bed. Hello, Everett. How are you? The nurse said, I have to go upstairs for a lobotomy. The doctor's eyes widen. A what? A lobotomy. Dr. Levitsky stares at Everett for a moment, speechless, then begins to turn toward the door. You wait right here. I'm going to go straighten this out right now. Interior hospital office. Dr. Levitsky enters the office in a fluster. What do you mean sending Everett up for a lobotomy? Why, hey, listen, Doc. We've tried everything else and nothing has worked. This is our last resort. His mother already signed for it. Well, that's just too bad. I really wish you would call it off. Interior hospital operating room. Dr. Adam, Dr. Barr, a male doctor, and a female nurse sit in scrubs as Everett is wheeled in on a bed. Dissolved to Dr. Adam drilling into Everett's skull. As blood spatters, the monitor begins beeping. It is hard. Dr. Adam pauses a moment, then resumes drilling. The monitor again signals trouble. Again, the doctor stops. Still acting up. Let's wait again. Later, the doctor drills a third time. Again, the machine beeps. Oh, forget it. Let's just call it quits for now. The doctors and nurse begin bandaging up Everett's head. Interior hospital, medical school patient room day. Dr. Levitsky finds Everett, head bandaged, resting in bed. Hello, Everett. How do you feel? The mummy, I guess. Ha! Huh. Well, they say that your heart kept flaring up, so they couldn't go through with it. I'm so glad. Me too. Later, Everett lies in bed, head still bandaged, sleeping. Interior, <coughs> hospital operating room, morning. Everett is again wheeled into the operating room as the doctors and some nurses stand nearby in scrubs. The team at Everett's side, Dr. Adam, grasps the drill. Blood spatters as the doctor drills into Everett's skull. Later on, the doctors slowly begin to pry open Everett's skull. Finally! Suddenly, the phone rings nearby. The emergency line. Quickly, Dr. Barr removes a glove and answers it. Hello? The man speaks. Is this Dr. Barr? Speaking. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, doctor, but your son just dropped dead. No! Not my son! Not my son! Dr. Barr replaces the receiver, sobbing uncontrollably. What's wrong? My son has just died. Oh. So sorry. Interior hospital, medical school patient room the next day. Dr. Levitsky approaches Everett, head still bandaged. I hope they didn't go through with it again, Everett. That was close. Too close. But imagine the doctor's son dying right in the middle of the operation. Everett gasps, gazing wide-eyed at the doctor. Interior hospital corridor. Everett again passes by the patient standing at attention beside the wall. Hi. Quickly, the man raises a fist. Again. Everett sways. Interior, hospital corridor. Everett walks along as the piano plays. Noticing the closed door of the former EST room, he peers inside. Intercut. The pianist plays a fast, scary tune. Back to the former EST room. 
A heap of people lay piled helplessly on the floor beneath the huge doorway in a frozen, zombie-like stupor. Everett, wide-eyed, shuts the door and then hurries away. Interior, hospital, Everett's dorm room. Everett sits on his bed in a new room containing only a few beds. Suddenly, he holds his head, crying out, Ah! The pain! God help me! Just speak my name, Everett. Jesus! 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 Everett looks up, startled. It's gone. Thank you, Lord. Interior hospital corridor morning. The male doctor stands conversing with a female nurse. I want you to start Everett on Thorazine. Yes, doctor. Interior hospital, Everett's dorm room morning. Everett lies in bed, attempting to hold a pencil. Everett, I don't want you to take the medication. At this time next year, you'll be painting murals for my sake. A while later, Everett awakens as the nurse enters the room. Time for your medication. The nurse hands Everett a few pills and a cup of water. Thanks. He puts the pills in his mouth and sips the water. Then, as the nurse exits, he slips them under his pillow. Dissolved to, Everett's smiling while flushing the pills down the toilet. Interior, hospital, corridor, day. Everett again walks by the patient, standing at attention. Hi. Don't talk to me, Everett. Everett looks startled, then continues down the hall. Interior, hospital, corridor. Everett walks through the hall, passing a group of patients sitting slumped over along the wall in their chairs. They seem to be in their own little worlds, lost and hopeless, and some even having wires sticking out of their heads. Interior, hospital, corridor, day. Everett mopes along in the hallway with his head down. Suddenly, Freddy, a teenage patient, approaches, trembling. Everett, God himself spoke to me to tell you something. He came to me a while ago and told me to say to Everett House, I am with you. I am still with you. Don't walk with your head down because you have the victory. You are a child of God and God's people should not and do not have to go around with their heads down. Walk with your head held high. Everett, I don't know, even know God. I've never been a religious person. But he told me to tell you that. Thank you. Sure. The teen walks off, still shaken. Everett resumes walking, except now holding his head up confidently. Everett walks on. Suddenly he sees the arm of God clothed in a robe, with the finger of God touching his mind. I'm beginning to correct and rearrange your mind back to how it's supposed to be after all of the devastation caused by the shock treatment. Interior hospital, Everett's dorm room. Everett enters his room. Get your Bible, Everett. Everett grabs his Bible. As he sits down, the pages fall open. He glances towards a verse. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Stand upon thy feet. Everett stands, raising his hands. Bam! God's power hits him. Rivers of living water begin to flow from his belly. Out of thy belly shall flow rivers of living water. Thank you, Lord. I have never felt so alive. Interior hospital corridor. As Everett walks in a hall, he feels and sees living water gushing from his belly like a torrent. Patients sitting by the walls ten feet away are hit by a mighty torrent and scream out, Jesus, as they fall off their chairs. Jesus! Jesus! Jesus. Interior, hospital, corridor, day. Everett walks along. Soon, he pauses, turns, and then backtracks up the hall. Interior, hospital, Everett's dorm room. Everett grabs a pencil and paper. He begins to write. Dissolve to, Everett sitting on his bed, holding a paper. Hearts of stone, to each his own to walk alone. Along this path we trod, till at last we lay our past beneath the lonely sod. Has your heart been warm all through life's storm with a spark from the fire of love? Or has it been cold without that spark, a cold and lonely heart of stone? Interior, hospital, corridor, day. Everett peeks into the hall. He spots Ned again, standing at attention in his usual spot. Son, go up and tell him that you and I love him. Everett exits the room and walks towards the guy. Hi, Ned. Ned pulls back a fist. Everett sways and then steps back. Jesus loves you, and I love you too. Ned drops his arm, takes in a deep breath, and then slowly looks around wide-eyed. Then smiling, he walks off. Interior, hospital, Everett's dorm room, night. Everett lies down on his bed and closes his eyes. Dissolve to, dream, elevator. Everett, in a beautiful blue shirt, rides in an elevator. Basement, Everett steps off the elevator and onto a ramp. He ascends the ramp into a crowd, finding a female patient staring at him with big, bewildered eyes. Jesus? Yes. 
Jesus walks on and stops and talks to a male patient. Jesus cares about you. He does? Yes. He can save you and help you. He's your way out of here. Back to Everett's dorm room. Everett, still lying in bed, abruptly opens his eyes. Interior, hospital, dining room the next morning. Everett and the other male patients sit eating their cereal. Interior, hospital, elevator. On an elevator, Everett pushes a button. The door closes. Everett, you need to witness to these poor creatures. Basement. Everett exits the elevator. Then, as he ascends the ramp into the crowd, he runs into the same lady from his dream. Jesus? Yes. Jesus. Everett takes a few more steps and then stops. He talks with a male patient, also as in his dream. Jesus cares about you. He does? Yes. He can save you and help you. He's your way out of here. Everett walks further into the crowd. Jesus can forgive you. Just ask him to. He's your answer to whatever you're going through. Interior, hospital, corridor, day. As Everett walks down a hall, suddenly a set of wooden stairs are let down from above. Everett spots a panel of wood standing upright at the foot of the stairs as though it were a door, but having no handle. Jesus then descends the stairs. As he nears the door, he knocks. I need to get into this place personally. Will you unlock the door by being the door for me to come through? Everett becomes teary-eyed. Yes. Jesus, come through. Immediately the door opens. Jesus enters the ward and then Everett watches as Jesus makes his way down the hall. Interior hospital ward day. As Everett and other patients lounge about in the ward, a female nurse enters. She begins to chat with another female nurse. Suddenly, she turns her head in wonder. Oh, the feelings of such peace and joy are all over this ward. It feels like heaven. Yes, it feels divine. Interior hospital, Everett's dorm room, day. Everett plays his guitar as he and fellow male patients sit singing, What a friend we have in Jesus. Soon, Philip, a teenage patient, hurries into the room crying. Why, Philip, what's wrong? Why are you crying? Everett, I just saw Jesus standing outside the store as I entered. Praise God. Jesus is here to bring deliverance to whoever is willing. Interior hospital corridor day. A female nurse attempts to pass Travis, a big 220-pound teen patient, but he pins her against the wall with his arms. Now where do you think you're going, huh? Frantically, she struggles to break free to no avail. Leave me alone! Leave me alone! Everett peers out from his room and spots the commotion. Travis, you let that lady go. Travis looks startled, then glares towards Everett. Oh yeah? And who do you think you are? Everett retreats into his room. Travis releases the nurse. As she runs off, Travis scowls towards Everett's room. Everett's door. Everett, weighing 118 pounds, lies down on his bed. Moments later, Travis barges in through the door, taking a seat at the foot of the bed. I've killed 14 people in my life, and you're next! By God's help and strength, it'd take you and a thousand like you to take me out, you devil! Travis lunges his full weight onto Everett, grabbing him by the throat. Then Everett, with the strength of Samson, drags him from the bed and out into the hall. Travis gets up and wrestles. Everett wrestles him to the floor. Two attendants rush in and grab Travis. One attendant scolds. Off to the G2 ward. That'll teach you. No, please, not the criminal ward. As they haul Travis off, Everett drops to his knees in prayer. Thank you, Lord. Interior, hospital, ward, day. Corridor. Everett slowly walks past the security door, staring at it. Interior, hospital, Everett's dorm room, night. Moonlight streams in through the window as Everett lies in bed with his eyes closed. Suddenly, jostling noises are heard coming from the hall. Everett opens his eyes. Corridor. A night attendant pushes a cart. Everett opens his door. Hi, Mr. Wesley. Everett enters the hallway, shutting the door behind him. Hello, Everett. Did I ever tell you about the time someone tried escaping from this place? No. Well, there was a patient here who climbed out onto a ledge, grabbed hold of a gutter, and then rode it all the way to the ground. But someone staff here found the poor guy and then ended up locking him up back worse up than ever. Interior, hospital, corridor, day. You know hallway, Everett finds a strange man in a beautiful, well-tailored suit poised near a bolted security door. As he approaches the man, he sees a small object in his hand. 
You don't believe I can unlock this door, do you? Here, I'll show you. The man moves the object past the door, pulls the door open, and then shuts it back as Everett stares, wide-eyed. You can't believe I did that, can you? Here, I'll do it again. The man repeats his actions, except now he holds the door open. Would you like to leave? You can leave now, if you want. Suddenly, Jesus appears and speaks to Everett. Son, if you want to be like me, you can stay until the end and get the complete victory. No. Thank you. All right. Clang, the stranger shuts the door. That's it. Everett glances towards the door one last time, and then back at the man. He's gone. Quickly, Everett turns and looks around. The stranger is nowhere to be found. Interior hospital, Everett's dorm room, night. As his roommate sleeps soundly, Everett lies on his back in bed. Suddenly, he sees God the Father floating through the room, adorned in a bundle of beautiful royal robes in colors of blue and white, with a long train of his robes flowing behind him, filling the room. Interior hospital, Everett's dorm room, day. Travis brazenly enters Everett's room once again, this time finding him at a window playing a guitar. Everett spots Travis, and then sets his guitar down abruptly. Hey, Ab, I see you got a guitar. Yes, it was my dad's. Well, I'm gonna drop it out of the window. Ha <laughs> ha, how about that? Travis rushes, grabs the guitar. Just then, a huge warrior angel drops to Everett's side. The mighty angel's wingless, wears a thick cape and short-sleeved robe reaching to his knees. He stands firmly, grasping a club while gazing intently at Travis. Stop, Travis. Don't throw the guitar at the window. Give it to me, or the angel of the Lord will strike you down. I don't believe in... In a flash, the angel strikes Travis in the belly. Immediately, he doubles over, dropping the guitar. Oh! <clears throat> Still doubled over, holding his stomach, Travis exits the room, gazing back at Everett, wide-eyed. Interior, hospital corridor, day, days later. Everett spots Travis walking along in a hall. Soon, the angel of God slams Travis against the wall. Then, moments later, against a radiator, Travis's face turns bloody and he drops down in a seizure. Everett becomes teary-eyed. Oh no! Son, if you will pray for him, I will let up and call my angel back. Lord, have mercy on him. Suddenly, Travis, still bloody, picks himself up from the floor and then walks on down the hall, unhindered. Interior hospital corridor day. Everett sits in a chair just outside his room, reading his Bible. As he looks up, he sees Travis walking towards him. Travis has a seat at Everett's feet. Everett, will you read me the Bible? Everett stares wide-eyed. Sure I will, Travis. Everett turns the pages to Psalm 91.1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Everett then turns to Lamentations 3.22 and 23. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Let me tell you what happened that made me a killer. Okay. When I was younger, I was sitting on the hillside one night, mocking a Holy Ghost prayer meeting that was going down below. Then, suddenly, an evil spirit came into me. Oh, no. After that, I wanted to start killing people. Well, I'm glad you're doing better now. Thanks, Everett. Me too. Interior Hospital Ward. <laughs> Everett finds Tom big, strong guy seated on a chair, pulling with his hands and feet chained to a wall. Hi. I'm Everett. Who are you? The name's Tom. So, Tom, how'd you end up in here? Well, my dad was jealous of me. He had it in for me, so he said I was crazy and hadn't committed. Sorry to hear. That must be awful, being chained up like that. It's enough to drive you crazy, if you ain't already. But one of these days I'm gonna bust this joint. You wait and see, Everett, I'll be a free man. So, Tom, are you a Christian? No, Ivor, I don't believe in that stuff. Well, I do. Nice meeting you, Tom. You do, Everett. See you later. Interior hospital corridor day. As Everett walks in a hall, suddenly Harry, an older guy, enters from the stairs, moaning and holding his finger. No! No! Why, Harry, what's the matter? Everett, I was outside, feeding the squirrels some nuts when one thought I was a nut and bit me. Oh, Everett no. tries not to smile. Oh no. 
Interior Hospital Ward Day, weeks later. Everett and Brother Shockley, in a suit, carrying a Bible, approach Tom as he again sits tugging at his chains. Hi, Tom. Hi, Everett. Who's this? This is my preacher friend, Brother Shockley. Hello, Tom. Hello. Tom, we'd like to pray for you. Well, you can try, but I can tell you right now it won't work. Everett and the preacher man lay hands on Tom's shoulders. Jesus, help Tom to believe in you. Touch his life, Lord, and free him from his shackles. Yes, Jesus! As Tom sits there, his feet begin to shake like crazy. I can't believe it, Everett. I just can't. Exterior, interior, hospital office day, weeks later. Everett approaches a door posted personnel. He opens it and enters the room, finding a lady seated at a desk. Ma'am, I've got to get a job somehow. I'll see what I can do. Sign your name on the form. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Everett quickly signs the paper. Interior, hospital, Everett's dorm room, night. As the moon beams in, Everett lies in bed, eyes closed. Interior, hospital ward, day. Again, Tom sits chained, attempting to break free. The chain's bolts now partially hanging out of the wall. Soon, a female nurse and male attendants approach him. Tom, we're letting you out of these. Tom's jaw drops. You mean it? Yes. The attendants unlock the chains. Tom jumps about happily. <laughs> Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Interior hospital, dining room, evening. Everett sits eating with Tom and some other guys at a table. Suddenly, Tom speaks excitedly under his breath. Freedom is so close, I can taste it. Interior hospital, solarium, day. Tom eyes the security door as he, Everett, and other guys sit in the ward. As the door opens, Tom's face lights up. Tom storms at the door, knocking down the patient entering the room, then grabs the door just before it closes. Corridor stairs. Through the door, Tom dashes to the stairs and then scales down six flights, passing an hysterical patient along the way. Help! Help! He's escaping! Attendants chase Tom down the stairs to no avail. Tom reaches the door marked exit, quickly opens it, and then hightails it out of the hospital. Exterior, hospital, ground, street. Tom grabs a bike from behind a bush, hops on, and then pedals his way to freedom. Hasta la vista, locals! The attendants scowl after him, shaking their fists. Interior, hospital, Everett's dorm room, morning. Everett awakens as the sun shines in through the window. Dissolved to, Everett, dressed for the day, standing at his window, peering out. In a moment, Dr. Levitsky enters the room. Great news, Everett. Since you're doing so much better, they'll be letting you go outside by yourself now. Everett gasps, staring wide-eyed. Thank you, Dr. Levitsky. You're welcome. Also, they'll be training you to work in the cabinet-making shop, so you'll have a trade when you get out. Interior hospital corridor. As Everett walks along in a hall, he spots Ned sweeping. Hi, Ned. Hi, Everett. Exterior hospital grounds. Everett steps outside. He spots an angel atop a tree. They appear in places, many times, where there is life that I created. Everett approaches a hill, drops down, and then rolls downward. At the foot of it, he gets back up, smiling. Everett sits on a bench near a fence, watching as a car on the other side pulls up along the curb with a flat tire. The driver gets out and then checks the flat. Dissolved to, the man removing the tire from the car. As he attempts to set it down, it rolls, hitting the hubcap and causing the lug nuts to spill over and then roll down into the sewer. Just great. What next? The man stands with one hand on his hip and the other scratching his head. Suddenly, Everett, still seated on the bench, speaks up. I'll tell you what you can do, sir. Take a lug nut from each of the other tires to hold the spare one on until you get home. The driver stares quietly at Everett for a moment. You know, I should be in there and you should be out here. Interior hospital, piano room. The pianist plays a short, lively tune. Interior, hospital, kitchen, day. Everett works on a cabinet in a huge kitchen as Milton, a tall, stocky male, tosses the giant salad with a pitchfork. So, Milton, how'd you end up here? The cook answers while continuing to make the salad. Everett, it was an ordeal. I was a monk at a Catholic monastery when I soon discovered the priests were sneaking off to see the nuns at night. So I squealed on them. They got so upset. Flashback. As the cook continues to narrate, a series of shots. The cook approaches the hospital in monk attire. As he enters the front doors, he's suddenly attacked by six burly male attendants. Valiantly, he fights back, using karate moves and throwing the guys around. 
Quickly, the men scatter. A worker soon approaches the monk, apologizing, but the monk then takes off running up the door. But they sent me here, saying I had a job to do. But when I got through the front door, six burly guys pounced on me at once. I surprised them, though, with my karate training, <laughs> and began throwing them right and left. Then a staff worker approached me, apologizing about a mix-up. So I ran out of here fast. Back to the present. I went back to the monastery, but they still had it in for me and set me up somewhere else. This time, though, I just went along with it. So they brought me back here and made me cook in the kitchen. That's quite a story. Too bad they tricked you. Do you like it here? It's all right. But there sure are a lot of mouths to feed. Everett picks up his toolbox. Well, nice talking to you, Milton. You too, Everett. See you later. Interior hospital, Everett storm room, morning, months later. Female nurse enters Everett's room as he awakens. Everett, now they'll be training you to work in the furniture shop. Thanks. Oh, nurse, do you know what ever happened to that older man, Mr. James, that was on this ward? As a matter of fact, Everett, I do. He had gotten sick. So they sent him up to the medical school hospital as a patient. Why, he's up there right now. Interior hospital, medical school patient room. Everett approaches the room with an open door. He glances in, finding Mr. James in bed with his arms outstretched in front of him, <coughs> appearing to grasp it thin air. Oh, the flowers! The beautiful flowers! Suddenly, the elderly man drops his arms to his side, collapsing. Mr. James. Interior hospital corridor. Everett walks past Bob and some workers standing around by the door of posted paint shop. They greet him. Hi. Uh, Hello, house. Hi, you guys. So when are you going to come work with us? I don't know. Maybe soon. Everett enters the door posted furniture shop. Interior hospital furniture shop. Everett physically works in the furniture shop. Exterior hospital grounds day months later. A painter stands painting on a ledge outside the hospital. Soon a male patient nears the ladder, calling up to him. Got a good grip on that brush? The painter gives the patient a half-puzzled look. Why, yes. Well, hold on to it then, while I take your ladder. The man grabs the ladder, walking off of it. The painter freezes, then still holding the brush, flails his arms. Hey, you! Come back here! As the patient, whistling, continues on with the ladder, the painter shrugs, flinging the brush over his shoulder. Interior, hospital. Everett's dorm room, morning. Female nurse enters Everett's room as he awakens. Everett, they'll be training you to work in the paint shop now. Interior hospital corridor. Everett passes Ned, pushing a meal cart in the hallway. Hi, Ned. Hi, Everett. Interior hospital paint shop. Everett enters the paint shop, finding two men seated at a table. One of them, Bart, is middle-aged, and the other, Lenny, is a big, strong, tough-looking young guy. Good morning. Hi, house. I'm Bart, your boss. He extends his right hand to Everett. They shake hands. Nice to meet you. And this here is Lenny. The big guy sits stone-faced, staring at Everett. Hello. Hi. So, have you ever painted before? No, sir. Then this will be a good experience for you. Interior hospital corridor day. Everett, Bob, Lenny, and some other guys busily paint a hallway. Suddenly, one painter trips over a can of paint, spilling it. Another painter falls to the floor in a laughing fit, kicking his legs. Interior, hospital, Everett's dorm room, morning. Dr. Levitsky enters the room as Everett puts on his shoes. Hey, Everett, we're giving you a pass so you can go visit your family. Interior, hospital, front desk. Smiling, Everett signs himself out of the hospital. Exterior, hospital, main entrance. Everett exits the doors and then trails down the pathway. Exterior, Everett's parents' street. As Everett descends the steep, hilly street, a dog begins to bark after him. Suddenly, the dog growls at his heels. Jesus, take care of him for me. As the dog's teeth touch Everett's ankle, God's power hits the dog in the head. Yelping loudly, the dog runs away. Exterior, Everett's parents' new house, front porch. Everett approaches a small, old, white frame home. He knocks on the door. His mom soon answers. They hug. <coughs> Interior, Everett's parents' new house, living room. As Everett and Mabel sit on the sofa, Everett looks about. We missed you, Everett. They say you're doing much better. You really do seem to be. Yes, thanks to the Lord. Well, I'm so glad. Oh, wait, I forgot something cooking. Mabel hurriedly gets up and leaves the room. Everett stands up. He looks towards some photos on the table. 
Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. My son, my son, Zerubbabel. But, Lord, my name isn't Zerubbabel. It's Everett. Zerubbabel is your spiritual name. And I still have a work for you to do here on this earth. Suddenly, Mabel enters the room. Okay. I'm back. Mabel casts a troubled glance over her shoulder. Your dad is in the other room, Everett. He's not doing too well, I'm afraid. Interior, Everett's parents' new house, Charles's room. Everett finds his dad shakily lying in bed. Hi, Dad. Hi, Everett. Welcome home. It's been a long time. Everett gives his dad a hug. I'm only here on leave. And it's back to the big house. The big house, huh? <clears throat> I know. It's still great to have you home. I was beginning to wonder if I'd ever see you again. I haven't been feeling too well lately. Sorry to hear that, Dad. I hope you feel better soon. Thanks. Interior, Everett's house, kitchen, evening. Everett picks up the fork as he and his mom sit at dinner. Great. Now I can finally eat with a fork. What? They, didn't they have utensils? Only spoons. Everett takes a bite of food. Oh, I see. Nothing beats home cooking. Why, thank you. Interior, Everett's parents' house, bedroom, morning. Everett sits on his bed. Suddenly he stares, wide-eyed. Daydream. Numerous people lay face up, crossways, and unconscious on a long conveyor belt, wrapped in some sort of heavy-looking material. They are each given a treatment from a machine in their foreheads by one of their doctors. Dissolved to people waking up, giddy, and then hugging each other. Next, large crowds of people walk along together through large gates, entering a fenced government community. Back to present. Everett continues to stare briefly, wide-eyed. Exterior, Everett's parents' street day. Everett hikes up a steep hill, no dog in sight. Exterior, Hospital Street. Everett exits the city bus in front of the hospital. Interior, Hospital, Everett's dorm room, night. Everett lies in bed, eyes closed as the moon beam beams in. Interior, Hospital, Solarium, day, the next day. Everett stares out a window as patients lounge about. Interior, Hospital, dining room, evening. Everett sits, eating dinner with other male patients. Exterior, Hospital, grounds. Everett takes a stroll on the grounds. Suddenly, he stops. Go home and see your dad again, Everett. He's dying. Exterior, interior, hospital, corridor. Everett quickly e enters the door from the outside and then rushes through the hallway. Interior, hospital, front desk. In a frenzy, Everett approaches the male front desk worker. Sir, I gotta get home and see my dad. He's dying. Whoa there. Have you got a pass? No, but they let me out recently. Sorry, you gotta have a pass. But, sir, this is an emergency. The worker stares at Everett for a moment. What's the name? Everett House. The worker looks through his papers. Okay. Sign here. The worker slides the papers towards Everett, who signs it. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, kid. My regards. Exterior, city bus, evening. <coughs> Everett rides the city bus. Exterior, interior. Everett's parents' house, dusk. Everett knocks on his parents' front door and then enters. Interior, Everett's parents' house, hallway. Everett enters the hallway taken aghast, stopping dead still in his tracks, his face becoming pale. A death angel stands outside the French doors to his dad's room. Trembling, Everett leans in on the wall and sobs. Lord, please call him back for daddy to be with me longer. Interior, Everett's parents' house, Charles's room. Everett enters the room as relatives and a doctor stand at his dad's bedside. He spots his dad's severely swollen belly. Dad. Mabel, teary-eyed, turns around. Everett. Your dad's unconscious. He's got uric poisoning. The doctor thinks he won't make it. Everett, solemn-faced, approaches his dad's bedside. He soon leaves the room. Interior, Everett's parents' house, spare bedroom. Everett enters another bedroom, lies down on a cot. Lord, you can heal daddy. Interior, Everett's parents' house, Charles's room. The doctor looks at Charles, shaking his head. He turns to Mabel. I'm sorry, Mabel. I've done all I could. I'll be back in the morning with the death certificate. Yes, doctor. I know, thank you. Interior, Everett's parents' house, spare bedroom. Suddenly, Everett jumps to his feet from the cot. Interior, Everett's parents' house, Charles's room. With gusto, Everett re-enters his dad's room. Listen, Hughes. You've got no faith in God for life. You'd rather believe in death. I'm going to pray now for dad. Everett lays his hand on his dad's severely distended belly. Jesus, rebuke this condition! 
Charles's body jumps three times. The swelling goes down significantly. Well, God's done the work. Exterior, Everett's parents' house the next morning. The doctor stands solemn-faced, clutching a paper as he knocks on Mabel's front door, smiling. Mabel answers. Hello, doctor. Come on in. Uh, I have the death certificate, Mabel. I'm so sorry. May I see him? Of course. Right this way. The doctor stares at Mabel and enters the house. Interior, Everett's parents' house, hallway. Down the hall, they reach the propped open French doors. The doctor peers into the room. He gasps, standing there, frozen. Charles shakily lies in bed, awake and smiling. Good morning, Doc. Interior, Everett's parents' house, Charles' room. Wide-eyed, the doctor proceeds toward Charles. Charles, you're alive. The doctor presses around Charles' abdomen. And, and, and the swelling's gone down. Yes, doctor. Jesus healed me. Well, that's wonderful. Interior, hospital, bathroom, day. Everett washes his hands while gazing in the mirror. Lord, would you mind changing my hair to a more brownish color? Drying his hands, Everett glances back into the mirror. He gasps. His dark hair is now brown with golden highlights. Interior, hospital, dining room, evening. As Everett and other guys sit eating, one patient seated nearby looks up from his food. He notices Everett's hair. Cool hat. Interior, hospital, hallway, day, months later. Everett peers out from his room. He spots nurses putting up Christmas decorations. Interior, hospital, Everett's dorm room. Everett stands with his back to the door. Go out there and show what Christmas is really about. Interior, hospital, hallway. Everett exits his room and then walks down the hall. Interior, hospital, office. Everett enters an office. He approaches a staff worker. I'd like permission to paint a manger scene on a wall for Christmas. A manger scene? Okay. Exterior, interior, hospital, main entrance, day. Everett dabbles paint onto a snowman painted on a door. He then opens the door, revealing a life-size manger scene painted on the hospital's main wall. Interior, hospital, main lobby. Everett stands, observing the mural. By this time next year, you'll be painting murals for my sake. Interior, hospital, Everett's dorm room, morning, months later. Dr. Levitsky enters the room as Everett awakens. Good morning, Everett. Good morning, Doc. Guess what, Everett? Now they'll be letting you come and go as you please. Exterior, church, stairs, morning. Charles, shakily, feebly, creeps up the stairs of a church, accompanied by Mabel and Everett. Their preacher greets them at the top, near the entrance. Welcome, Charles. Glad you could make it. Thank you, brother. There's nowhere else I'd rather be than in the house of the Lord. Interior church sanctuary. Everett, Mabel, and the other church folks stand singing, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, as Charles sits singing nearby. Exterior, interior, hospital paint shop, day. Everett enters the paint shop, finding his boss seated. Morning, house. I got work for you by the morgue today. Interior, hospital, basement, morgue. Everett sits near the door posted, morgue. He peeks inside. No one is there. Suddenly he gasps, wide-eyed, as he spots a huge, circular-shaped plastic container filled with brains, about eight feet in diameter and five feet deep. Basement corridor. Everett proceeds to another door, finding it locked. He opens it with a key, discovering a stairwell leading further down. Stairs. Everett cautiously descends the old, dim-lit stairs. A dungeon. Everett gasps he finds a creepy, dungeon-like area with prison cells hewn from bedrock and enclosed with metal bars. Quickly, he turns and then speeds back up the stairs. Interior, hospital lab, morning, nearly three years later. A few workers busily place brain monitors all over Everett's head. Interior, hospital office, day. A female office worker sits at a desk holding some papers as Everett stands nearby. You have the most analytical mind of anyone we've ever encountered. Interior hospital office morning. Dr. Levitsky, clutching papers, approaches a male doctor. I have Everett's test results. Let me see. Dr. Levitsky hands the papers to the other doctor, who then looks them over. The man looks up abruptly. This boy should never have been in here. Interior hospital, Everett's dorm room, day. Dr. Levitsky enters the room as Everett sits drawing. Everett, I like for you to sit in with me on a psychodrama session. I'd like to hear your input. Interior Hospital Solarium. Everett, many other patients, and Dr. Levitsky sit in chairs in a circle. A 
There's a beautiful lady, 30s, sits in the middle. Okay, now please tell us what happened. Well, it all began when my husband and I went on a trip overseas. We were just newlyweds at the time. John was busy playing a game of polo and doing so well. The woman begins to fidget. When he fell from his horse, then another planter came alongside and accidentally struck him hard on the head with his stick, killing him. As the woman begins sobbing pitifully, the doctor hands her some tissue. And I've been so depressed ever since. Now, Everett, what do you think? Everett stands to his feet. Ma'am, I know what your greatest trouble is. You knew this man did this on purpose, and you never told anybody. He liked you, and you were afraid to admit it. The woman covers her ears. No, I don't want to hear this! You know, Everett, I think you hit the nail right on the head. Exterior hospital grounds, day. Everett finds Steve standing near two horses hitched to a wagon. He approaches them and then pets the horses. Hello, Everett. Hi. Say, how'd you like to be put in charge of the grounds crew? Okay, sure. Later on, Everett and some other men busily tidy the grounds. Everett approaches two women seated on a bench. One woman, mid-forties, wears a long dress, her hair pulled back tightly in a bun. Hello, ladies. Nice day, isn't it? Sir, I'm a prophetess. The Lord is showing me they'll be letting you out within six months. And your dad is sick. I see your mom in black. Ah, uh, thank you, ma'am. Everett becomes teary-eyed as he walks off. Interior, Everett's parents' house, bathroom at night. Everett washes his dad's hair in an old clawfoot tub. Interior, Everett's parents' house, Charles' room. At his bedside, Everett finishes combing his dad's hair. Thanks, Everett. Now, would you go get the guitar and play me a song? Sure. Everett retrieves the guitar off the wall, then, as he plays and sings a gospel song, his dad silently weeps. Dissolved to Charles, at the song's end, shakily wiping away tears. Thanks. That's my favorite song. Psalm 103, verse 1 to 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth life thy from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Ever wipes tears from his own eyes. Interior hospital corridor day. Everett walks near a wash. He pauses. Everett's POV. Suddenly, Everett is transported through time and space. The field of Benjamin in Israel. Everett is dropped into a beautiful field, waist high. He stands up, gazing about. Then, eyes closed, he takes in a deep breath. Suddenly, God the Father appears. Everett. This is the field that belongs to the tribe of Benjamin. You originated from that tribe. This is so wonderful, Lord. Back to the hospital corridor. Again, by the washroom, Everett looks about, wide-eyed. Interior, hospital, Everett's dorm room, night. Everett kneels, praying. He then crawls into bed. Dissolved to, Everett waking up as the sun shines in through the window. Interior, hospital, dining room, day. Everett sits eating at a table with other male patients. Interior, hospital, stairwell. Everett peers down the stairwell. Go down these steps to the outside. Everett descends six flights of stairs. Exterior, hospital, courtyard. Everett pushes open the door. He steps outside. Keep going forward. Everett continues to watch as God leads. Turn left. Go to the end of that walkway. Turn right. Exterior, hospital, front grounds. Everett walks to the front of the hospital, near the gate. Stop, look, and turn. Everett stops, looks, and turns to his left. He finds an older gentleman standing beneath a tree. Go to let him. Everett walks towards the stranger. The man turns. So, you're the reason God sent me back here three times today, after I had left from visiting someone. Come here, brother, and let me pray. God sent me here to pray the final prayer of faith and deliverance in your life. Everett steps closer. The man of God lays his hand on Everett's head. Wham! The power of God hits them both. 
Woo-hoo-hoo! Well, now that I've prayed, I've got to get going. But God has finished somehow or other. Interior hospital, Everett's dorm room, morning. Female nurse enters the room as Everett puts on shoes. Everett, you're being moved to a new ward today, a lower one. Interior hospital, solarium, day. A male patient stands talking with Dr. Ray, a male doctor. Say, Doc, I suppose was wondering if we could have ward rule. Ward rule? What on earth is that? Oh, you know, for us to have more say so about what goes on in here. Well, I don't know. Then again, maybe that's not such a bad idea. So it's a yes? Okay, yes. Ward rule it is. Thanks, Doc. Thanks a lot. Dissolved to David, Everett, and other male patients chanting. War rule, war rule, war rule. Listen up, guys. Let's call ourselves the IFRO Freedom Grant. Okay, okay yeah. yeah. Interior hospital, dining room, evening. Everett and some other guys sit eating at a table while watching TV. I could really get used to this war rule stuff. Interior, Everett's parents' house, Charles' room, night, a few months later. Everett has a seat beside his dad's bed. I'm going to go, Everett. The Lord is letting me know. No! It's almost time. I'll miss you, Dad. I'll miss you too, son. Interior, Everett's parents' house, spare bedroom, morning. As Everett sits on the bed, suddenly he stares, wide-eyed. Daydream. Charles stands in a desert place near some train tracks. His bags packed and stacked beside him, while upon the horizon glow the bright lights of heaven. This is his last journey. He's going to my place. He's going to heaven. Exterior, Everett's parents' house, front yard, day. Mabel gives Charles a hug and a kiss, and then steps aside. Then Everett and his mom, tearful, watch as paramedics wheel him across the yard to an ambulance onto a stretcher. I don't want to die. Bye, Daddy. I love you. Charles is placed into the ambulance and then driven away. Interior, Charles' hospital room, day. Charles shakily lies in bed as Mabel holds his hand and wipes tears from her eyes with a hanky. Well, Mabel, I'll be going to heaven shortly. How do you know you're going to heaven, Mommy? How do you know? Because, my darling, I've got this string and I feel a tug at the other end. I'll miss you, Charles. I love you. I love you, too. Mabel hugs Charles as he serenely closes his eyes for the last time. Mommy. A while later, Everett slowly approaches his dad's lifeless body. Briefly, he touches dad's hand, begins to weep. Interior, Everett's mom's house, Charles's old room, day. Children play in the room as Everett busily breaks down his dad's hospital bed, leaning the parts against the wall. Suddenly, Everett stares towards the dining room. Charles stands there, straight and tall, dressed as a knight in full shining armor, young and healthy again. Interior, Everett's mom's house, kitchen, night. Everett, now 24, Mabel, now 58, teary-eyed, Ethel, now 36, and Debbie, age 7, sit around the kitchen table. I don't think I'll ever get used to your dad being gone. He was a man with a heart of gold. Ethel reaches for her mom's hand and then holds it. Interior, Everett's mom's house, bedroom, a while later. Debbie, in pajamas, sits on her bed, staring into space. Daydream, flashback. As the girl continues to sit and stare, wide-eyed, sounds of children talking are heard. Hey, let's play freeze tag. Grandpa can be base, and I'll be it. No, hey, hey. Hey. <laughs> Tag, you're it. <laughs> run, run. Dissolve to... Debbie in the yard, running towards her grandpa as he sits in a chair, shakily stretching out his long, thin arms to her. Charles grabs her by the hand in the nick of time. Gotcha. Safe. Back to the present. Debbie gets up and then kneels beside her bed. Lord, I miss Grandpa so much. I didn't even get to see him go. Please tell him bye for me, Jesus. Amen. As Debbie climbs into bed, she glances towards the wall. She gasps. Jesus and her grandpa stand there, side by side, with her tall, slender grandpa towering taller than Jesus. It's Grandpa! And Jesus! Exterior, Everett's mom's house, porch, morning. Everett and Mabel stand on the front porch. Goodbye, Mom. 
Oh, Everett, I must tell you I had the most wonderful dream. I dreamt that all of heaven was ringing with the sound of your dad's beautiful guitar playing. That must have been really something. Oh, it was. Interior, car, hospital parking lot day. With Everett in the driver's seat, he and Dr. Levitsky sit in a parked 55 Plymouth in a hospital parking lot. Ready, Everett? Yes, Doc. Say your prayers. <laughs> the doctor chuckles. Everett revs up the car's engine. Outside the car, Everett slowly drives the car around the parking lot. Back inside the car, as Everett parks the car, the doctor wipes his brow. Whew, we made it. No, you did good. Thanks a lot, Doctor, for teaching me how to drive. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Interior, hospital office day. Everett busily works on a key punch machine. Interior, hospital, Everett's dorm room, day. Dr. Levitsky enters the room as Everett sits on his bed. Now we are sending you to college to take computing courses. Interior, college classroom, day. Everett and a group of women sit in class as a professor lectures. Later on, Everett and his classmates busily take exams. Interior, hospital, dining room, evening. Everett and the other guys sit eating and watching TV. Interior, hospital, office, day, weeks later. Dr. Levitsky sits at his desk as Everett sits at his side. So, how the computer course go? I graduated second in my class. Great! Well, I'd love to put you on stuff here, Everett. The other doctors would never go for it. I understand, Doctor. I haven't studied psychology, but I have studied the Bible. Psalms and Proverbs are full of wisdom. You've come a long way, Everett. As the doctor holds out his right hand, they shake hands. If your Jesus Christ can do this for you, then you keep following him all you can. Interior hospital corridor. Everett walks through a hallway. Office. As Everett reaches the end of the ward, he finds God the Father seated at a desk in an office, working. He is in business attire, with his short-sleeved shirt revealing his strong, massive arms. He turns towards Everett. These buildings are scheduled for destruction. They will no longer be a place of torture for people's hearts and souls and minds that my people have been put into. They will be torn down, and instead they will build more home-like dwellings for the people who have these problems in their lives and can't get any help. By the way, Everett, they'll be making a movie of your life, and these things that you went through in here will be included in it. Suddenly, Everett is caught up in the air, past the ceilings and rooftops. Outer space, near the Earth, Everett ends up in outer space beside God the Father, who is now dressed in magnificent royal robes and a crown. Together they look on at the beautiful rotating earth. This is the world before sin came along. It's so beautiful, Lord. Son, I would that all my children walk this close to me, but they either won't let go of the natural things or don't know that I want them to. Back to the corridor. Everett looks around in awe and then approaches the elevator. He pushes the down button. Soon the door opens. Everett steps on, and then the door closes. Elevator. Inside the elevator, Everett presses a button. The door closes. Look around. This is the last trip you'll have to take on this elevator as a patient. Everett glances around, wide-eyed, at the elevator. Main hallway. Everett exits the elevator and then heads toward the main entrance. Front desk. Everett signs a paper at the desk. The front desk worker smiles. Bye. Have a nice day. Thanks, sir. You too. Exterior hospital, main entrance, pathway. Everett exits the doors and then pauses. He then heads down the stairs and out along the path. Exterior hospital, street. Everett approaches the street and then stands there. Dissolved to Everett boarding a city bus and then taking a seat. In a moment, the bus drives off down the street. The end.